On Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, Al-Qaeda executed a plan in which a group of 19 men, mostly from Saudi Arabia, hijacked four passenger airplanes in order to crash two into the New York World Trade Center's Twin Towers, one into the Pentagon and one into either the Capitol Building or the White House. 3,000 people, including the terrorists, died on that fateful morning, resulting in this event being the worst tragedy in United States history. A vast wealth of conspiracy theories have emerged from quote-unquote truthers who assert that the United States government was directly involved in it to carry out a stealthy false flag operation as a pretext to go into war with Afghanistan. People get so emotionally engrossed in these conspiracies, sadly myself in the past being one, that they willfully abandon critical thinking, logic, and reason. Here are a few claims by truthers that I would like to tackle. Claim 1. Squibs can be seen ejecting out from the towers as they collapsed. According to popular mechanics, this claim has been thoroughly debunked. Once the tower began to collapse, the weight of all the floors above the collapse zone bore down with pulverizing force on the highest intact floor. Unable to absorb the massive energy, that floor would fail, transmitting the forces to the floor below, allowing the collapse to progress downward through the building in a chain reaction. Engineers call this process quote-unquote pancaking, and it does not require an explosion to begin, according to David Biggs, a structural engineer at Ryan Biggs Associates and a member of American Society of Civil Engineers, a team that worked with the FEMA report. Like all office buildings, the WTC towers contain a huge volume of air. As they pancaked, all that air along with the concrete and other debris pulverized by the force of the collapse was ejected with enormous energy. Quote, when you have a significant portion of a floor collapsing, it's going to shoot out air and concrete dust out of the window. End quote. Claim 2. The building fell straight down just like a controlled demolition into their own footprint. Controlled demolitions usually start from the bottom up and not from the top down. The demolition of a building is rigged with explosive charges that are typically planted in strategic locations on the base of the building to blast out the foundation of the building so that it falls on itself. The Twin Towers did not fall straight down, they began to lean or tilt towards the point of the plane impact. The building followed the path of least resistance. Claim number 3. Jet fuel does not burn hot enough to melt steel. This claim is one of the smoking guns from truthers as proof as a controlled demolition. According again to popular mechanics, I'll lend you the science behind how steel behaves when it is subjected to fire. Jet fuel burns at 800 degrees to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, not hot enough to melt steel, which is 2,750 degrees Fahrenheit. However, experts agree that for the towers to collapse, their steel frames didn't need to melt, they just had to lose some of their structural strength, and that required exposure to much less heat. Quote, I have never seen melted steel in a building fire, end quote, says retired New York Deputy Field Chief Vincent Dunn, author of The Collapse of Burning Buildings, A Guide to Fire Ground Safety. Quote, but I've seen a lot of twisted, warped, bent, and sagging steel. What happens is that the steel tries to expand at both ends, but when it can no longer expand, it sags and the surrounding concrete cracks. Quote, steel loses about 50% of its strength at 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. End quote. Notes, Senior Engineer Fareed Alfawik Hari, of the American Institute of Steel Construction. Quote, and at 1,800 degrees, it is probably at less than 10%, end quote. NIST also believes that a great deal of the spray-on fireproofing insulation was likely knocked off of the steel beams that were in the path of the crashing jets, leaving the metal more vulnerable to all the heat. But jet fuel wasn't the only thing burning, notes Foreman Williams, a professor of engineer at the University of California, San Diego, and one of the seven structural engineers and fire experts that PM consulted. He says that while the jet fuel was the catalyst for the WTC fires, the resulting inferno was intensified by the combustible material inside the buildings, including rugs, curtains, furniture, and paper. NIST reports that pockets of fire hit 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit. I will end this episode with a video clip from Purgatory Ironworks to put this tired argument out of its misery. This is a piece of half-inch thick steel, 
836, structural steel, designed for structures. This is a 250 pound anvil. I'm gonna put this steel in the back of this anvil and I'm going to lift this 250 pound anvil with this bar of steel. Do you see how the structural steel is supporting this anvil? Okay, there. Now, in my furnace, I have an identical piece of half inch bar of steel, just like this. And it's gonna be around 1800 degrees, just 300 more than jet fuel when it comes out. And I want you to see something very interesting. Go into the forge. It's very hot, but not melted. Obviously, it is not melted. I put this in the oven. Now, watch this. I'm going to take my pinky finger, my pinky finger, half inch solid steel. Check it out. It's a freaking noodle. Your argument is invalid. Get over it. Find a job.